uh, the Women and Gender Studies uh, Distinguished Lecturer for this year. Uh, every spring, the Women and Gender Studies Department uh, hosts an eminent scholar who's made important contributions to feminist and gender studies. Uh, in recent years, we've had uh, Judith Pascal, Jean Marisek, Anna Clintock, Rosemary Garland Thompson, and Gail Dines as visitors to the campus. Uh, this evening, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, this year's distinguished lecturer, Cynthia Willett. She's the Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Philosophy at Emory University. Professor Willett is a philosopher specializing in political ethics, <coughs> social ethics, interspecies ethics, <laughs> philosophical psychology, race and gender studies, philosophy and literature, and of course, humor. Cynthia received her BA from the University of Missouri in political science and her PhD in philosophy from our neighbor down the road at Penn State University. She's been at Emory University since 1996, uh, and in 2006, she established uh, at Emory the Institute for the History of Philosophy. Cynthia is an enormously uh, prolific writer and author of several books, including Interspecies Ethics. And I want to note, in parentheses in her CD, she says a serious ethics with a comic twist. That might be interesting to some of you. Uh, Irony in the Age of Empire, The Soul of Justice, Social Bonds, and Racial Hubris, and Maternal Ethics and Other Slave Moralities. She's presented and published numerous works on humor and laughter. A sample of some recent titles include Going to Bed White and Waking Up Arab, Stand Ups Against Ethnophobia, The Seriously Erotic Politics of Laughter, Can the Subaltern Animal Laugh, Ethnophobia and the Contagion of Laughter, and Feminist Humor and post nietzschean Philosophers. Tonight's talk draws from her work on a forthcoming book titled The Belly Laugh, Affective and Emotion Politics of Humor, which is being co-authored with her sister, Julie Willett. This evening, we're honored to have Professor Willett present a lecture entitled On Humor, Feminist Makeovers from Sluts and Other Social Mis Misfits. Please join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you all for coming and also for coming to our dinner. Um, to make it here. Unfortunately, we had really severe um, weather in Lanza, so I got here very, very late last night. Um, well, also, thank you, Sheila, um, for this incredibly fun conference. I just love it. I mean, what could be more fun than just thinking about what makes us laugh and um, what's funny? But of course, there is that old cliche that to analyze a joke is to kill it. I'm hoping by the end of the conference we won't have killed comedy here. <laughs> you know. um, I also want to thank Susan very much for inviting me and the um, <coughs> introduction too. And so this this talk is part of a book. It is um, it is yeah co-authored with my sister who is a historian. Um, so yes, true spirit, true sisterhood, I think. And in fact, really um, we are beginning with a large historical claim, not claims that were in an age of comedy and satire. So think about how uh, so many people get their news um, from uh, late night comedy shows, retweeting the daily show. Well, we um, think that comedy and satire, more than just infotainment, more than just amusement and um, mixed with a few facts, we think that there's something very basic about it that allows us to both handle our gut uh, instincts and to get to the gut uh, issues. Now, um, you may know as well uh, that comic, well, cultural critics, elite cultural critics, philosophers to be sure since the time of Plato have treated comedy as a less serious art, less serious, for example, than tragedy. Yeah. Among their uh, charges are that comedy displays emotions out of control, but it displays or um, encourages or more animal-like instincts, a little part of us as human beings. Now, humor can be appreciated by cultural beings and philosophers, and 
And in fact, it, it is and has increasingly been appreciated in the last several centuries, especially in, in the U.S. in the last 150 years. But when it is appreciated by these more cult, um, cultural needs, it's valued as an elevated game of dry web, a more cerebral game that rational minds play. So a key assumption um, with this valorization of some parts of humor is that animals, for example, could never be true agents of humor. <laughs> it's also true that there are other assumptions. Women and social inferiors have been viewed as closer to the animal and also as ruled more by excessive emotions. And they've also been perceived as less capable of genuine humor. Worse yet, along with other social inferiors, women are treated as Mockery's natural carpets. Now here I have on the screen a meme that I found from social media platforms. And um, let me just read it to you first of all. I can see there's something of a dumb blonde there. Um, all men are assholes. And one of and then underneath that, one of my five boyfriends broke up with me. So here we have something of a dumb blonde, and then underneath is a subtext. Uh, uh, she's a slut. Well, <laughs> when women do laugh, their laughter, unlike that of the more logical mind, is thought to display their emotions out of control. Even the feminist comedian, and um, she is also identified, she identifies herself as a slut, Amy Schumer relies on the trope of a hysterical woman. Now let's take a quick look. This is a video of hers. I'm going to show you, first of all, the first few seconds of it, and then some towards the end. You're here to learn to evade and diffuse the ancient art of female emotional combat. Is that a power you wish to possess? Yes, Sensei. Jeff, you're up first. Jeff, Caitlin is your girlfriend. It's date night. Bow and begin. You look really pretty tonight. Oh, just tonight? You always look pretty. You know, you never say beautiful. Uh, I mean beautiful, it's just not a word I use. It's interesting, because in one of your old emails, you called your ex beautiful. You were going through my emails? Hey, if you have nothing to hide, it shouldn't be a problem. It's about privacy. Stop yelling! I'm not yelling! Stop in bounds! What did Jeff do wrong? Born. Jeff, get in line. <laughs> <laughs> never get your... Okay, so um, the, the next um, scene to a skill feature, you know, for example, women who are in a period, or they may be set off by a period, they may be set off just by, we'll see, practicing to where uh, um, a boyfriend just has his nose stuck in a newspaper. And they're only able to be really passive by these hysterical women with um, references to their trusty therapist or to Oprah. Let's take a look now at. Um, uh, a scene that has Amy Schumer herself step in as playing. Now, now in most of the skit, Amy Schumer is playing all too serious sensei who must train um, these confused boyfriends and husbands in the ancient art, uh, ancient um, art of female emotional combat. But in the last scene, she too becomes unhinged. Let's take a look at this scene and see what's.
with the embrace of sluts and social misfits as comedy central agents rather than as targets being to revamp the major theories of, for, uh, for too long on the meaning of comedy and laughter. So our question is how might that concept of the common change as a ridiculed target step forward as agents? Now throughout history, to be sure, among elites have often found humor tool of resistance. Let's take a more recent example. There's been a feminist response to a debate that cultural critic Christopher Hitchens rekindled in 2007 when he attempted to explain why women aren't funny. And this is an essay he wrote in Vanity Fair. Now, backed up by modern science, uh, or actually, this is a single study that he uses uh, in the name of science. It has 10 men and 10 women, so we might say science. Um, <laughs> his answer is that Mother Nature, that bitch, he's very scientific, we like to that um, just made it so that men have to find some way to appeal to women, and humor is apparently the trick. And he writes, um, the chief task in life that a man, a man has to perform is that of impressing the opposite sex, and Mother Nature is not so kind of men in fact she equips many fellows with very little armament for the struggle. An average man has just one outside chance, he better be able to make the lady laugh. Women, on the other hand, have no corresponding need to appeal to men in this way. They already appeal if you get undressed. So men in there is a tits and ass joke. Um, so in effect, the science becomes a tits and ass joke. The best response, of course, is going to have to be feminist humor, and to be sure, um, get plenty of feminist responses to um, kitchens. But one of the more recent is um, from 2016. This is from People magazine. And uh, it, what they did was they assembled really a kick ass group of actresses and um, comedians to turn the table on the old gender uh, stereotypes that kitchen swallows pretty much wholesale. And what we're going to do is listen to them ponder the age old question can men be funny? Okay, let's see if I've done this right. So I don't, uh, let's see, I didn't feel right that time. So I, so I can go, if I go back. Okay, so maybe not all of them did it in <laughs> um, So I just needed to do that one. Uh -huh. oh, when I think of stories about men, I think kitchen. It's really great. I mean, God bless them for trying. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if, if men will ever be able to break through the glass seat. Of the comic and thus the agent of 
humor. It's part of a persistent historical narrative that has come to define the construct of the um, rational man. This man in turn defines others as humorless or silly things, and his own civilized self as the one whose measured enjoyment of humor offers a cerebral interlude amidst um, serious matters. Let's look at a bit more at cerebral humor, and this again through uh, Christopher Hitchens, because he offers a pithy formulation of what women lack. You will see, that, and this is a quote from him that's up on the screen, you will see what women, what each meant when he described lyricism as an epitaph on the depth of feeling. Male humor understands that life is quite possibly a joke. Humor is part of the armor plate to deal with that farcical bitch life. Now for um, Hitchens, and um, others uh, like him, much of humor devolves into a refined mental act, a dry intellectual enjoyment of puzzles, far from the visceral depths of the gut's belly laugh. At best, at best this humor of elite offers a moment of transcendence for the fatalistic. We can find um, an example of this kind of cerebral wit um, in Gallo's humor. And here's an example, in fact, that appears in um, John Marielle's very helpful stamp for the Encyclopedia of Philosophy and um, Art Called Humor. So, um, as the story goes, on his deathbed, Oscar Wilde said, the wallpaper is atrocious, one of us has to go. <laughs> this is an example of very, very cerebral wit. Um, it elevates us, it elevates this kind of moment of transcendence, um, you know, a kind of cosmic sense of who we are. Now, at its worst, and too often, uh, humor, uh, much of the humor that is engaged in, reinforces opposition of dualisms, uh, men versus women, for example. I think, you know, and here think of also both the dumb blonde meaning that we have at the beginning, or rape jokes, or tits and ass jokes. Um, all of these are designed, or are pretty much in effect, to keep those deemed inferior in their place. When the laughter of social inferiors is recognized, it's often dismissed as more visceral and less cerebral, and, and that's also just more of a young kind of belief. Just kind of the idea that um, girls can be silly, that she was silly. There are a few social races to the political force, uh, social outsiders often very visceral laughter. Marx's simple bias in standard conceptions of what humor is. And indeed, this bias is systemic, requiring a full frontal attack on the very foundations of comic theory. Challenging cultural dualisms, as well as human and non human hierarchies, we revisit the four dominant theories that have explained laughter and comedy across disciplines through the multiple lenses of feminist as well as other um, game-changing comics. Uh, now, I've listed those four major theories <coughs> above, and uh, first just to go over them very briefly, and then to go over them, and then revised versions of them. So, superiority the theory is the, um, the, the idea that um, we gain pleasure by mocking others, by laughing at them. Belief theory um, argues that the comic is a physical release of tensions. There's also the cerebral approach, and this is the one that's most valued today, that laughter sources in the perception of incongruities. So by the perception of incongruities, this is something like a jack-in-the-box type of violation of mental patterns or anything that offers surprise. So giving us a kind of mental jolt. And then there's a fourth uh, significant theory of laughter and humor that it originates in play. And this is influenced by many different studies, including animal studies, as well as a lot of speculations from evolutionary theory. Now, our approach is um, uh, to steer away from all kinds of variations of the mind-body dualisms of the rational man. And this would be include, for example, a very sophisticated version of this, that um, we have a rational mind, but we're caught in um, these mortal bodies. Um, so that's one important version of that uh, dualism. And instead, we begin with the idea that, mm, well, we're animals. 
to embodied social cells as are many other species. Taken on the picture figure of the rational man, our topsy turvy approach elevates the belly laugh, the laughter from the gut. We begin our bottom up vegetarian comedy by first turning superiority theory on its head. Now, superiority theory has been the oldest approach to understanding the pleasure of ridicule, going all the way back to Plato. It's a pleasure of lacking down. Hitchens draws on superiority theory as just so the story of why women can't be funny. He writes that male humor prefers to laugh at someone's expense, whereas women, bless their tender hearts, would prefer that life be fair. The superfluous nastiness of such ridicule continues to make some think today, as did Plato, that ridicule should be frowned upon or even censored. Yet, since the modern revolutions and the establishment of free speech as a basic right, even misogynistic or racist jokes are vehemently defended. Think about the French uh, journalists at the satiric um, rag, Charlie Hebdo, and their defense of a uh, cartoonist mockery of the Islamic prophet as a terrorist. Backed by appeals to free speech, some argue that comedy has no limits and all is fair game. If that vowel is punctured um, with an uneasiness, an uneasiness over where and when fuzzy lines can be crossed. So for sure, the um, 2015 Paris massacre was a tragic overreaction to the French magazine's cartoons. But the deliberate slurring of a figure that was revered as a central source of identity for a racialized minority in Christian Europe, that registers as a provocation, as an act of arrogance. And sadly, these kinds of acts of arrogance you know, as we know from the history of world wars in Europe too, they do produce tragic reactions. Uh, these often tragic consequences can spiral out of control, suggesting the need for some kind of shared sense of fair play. And indeed, we do find across much of the political spectrum a widespread cultural code and a tacit rule of comedy that one punches up and up down. Um, and this idea, well, the idea here is that laughter is rightly directed at the hubris of elites, and such ridicule is perceived to be taking those elites down a notch. And hence we have the golden rule of how they punch up, not down. But as you can guess, this is not going to be an easy call, that is, who needs to be taken down a notch. Um, I think of the last presidential election season, for one. Um, uh, between Crooked Hillary and, um, uh, and Lucy Roberts. <laughs> Robert. So it's not going to be an easy call, you know, who has too much power. Yet, we'll just say here, you know, for sure, women seeking, for women seeking equality, there are clear instances of misrepresentation and abuse, as in, for example, the, um, the radio talk show host was told. Um, Rush Limbaugh in uh, 1992, 1992, yeah, began, that was when he began blasting uh, feminists and so Nazis. Now, I have here up on the screen an image of uh, Gloria Steinem. She's a seventh wing feminist and an icon for the women's movement. And this was a period in feminism that wasn't really known for the use of much humor, but even she engages in some of it. Uh, if you look at the picture up here, this is. Um, uh, that captures that Stein and blames Rush for giving feminism a bad name. But she even said more than that. I mean, she, um, well, first of all, she attempted her own um, ironic comeback, and she pointed out in an interview just about four years after uh, Rush Limbaugh started on feminism of Nazis, she pointed out that uh, Rush Limbaugh's views, uh, anti abortion, anti locking the family clinics, those are a little bit closer to the Nazis than the feminists. <laughs> Um, but most importantly, she also did remark, this is described in Clinton in the 1990s, she said that it was that single mocking slur of Rush Limbaugh that sunk the feminist movement at the time. So comedy is serious business. 
In fact, um, we, would, you know, we would argue, of course, that feminists with their irony and humor are seeking nothing less than a level playing field to count the old hierarchies. So it might be true that um, women would prefer life to be fair, at least some women would prefer that life would be life to be fair. But the argument here, our argument is that that sensibility, that sensibility does not annihilate humor, it fuels it. Thus, we rebrand superiority theories, loving humor, and an effort to reclaim the egalitarian aims against hierarchies and biases. So very simply, our assumption is that comedy is not always in a sense entertainment, and it only operates on a field of affect and power. And on this field of affect and power, we possess various degrees of status and of a social capital. Um, often enough, comedy's impact on this field is not neutral. So here, this is um, an image of U2's uh, Bono, many of you all know. Uh, and it's a nice, it, 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 he got, he was invited to um, speak before Congress, um, I brought him before the Senate um, to, for a discussion on terrorism. And um, there he argued that comedy should be deployed he said, it's like you speak violence, you speak the language of the terrorists, you're on their terrain, they won, but you laugh at them, um, and they do stepping down the street, and you take away some of their power. So it, this is one nice, um, for, uh, one nice way of stating that power that comedy has. Now, let's turn to the second major theory, relief theory, which explains laughter as a, a release of so it's a physical process. Now this um, process of relief is often viewed as some kind of venting, which is a venting of one kind or another. And as venting is thought to make us feel good, but actually to diffuse any kind of political action, any kind of motivation for even social change. And sometimes it's true that comic release um, is just a feel good moment, but sometimes it's more than that. Um, for one, we do know you now there's so much evidence, physiological evidence, that it actually alters our chemistry and allows for a fuller feeling of life and vitality. But even more complex sociobiological processes might be glimpsed in that ancient term, um, catharsis. Commonly today, we think of catharsis as the healing of the heart, but it allows us to cope, but also to heal. And this healing process is thought, in turn, um, by psychologists to, um, well, psychologists argue that what is that healing? They argue that it is, again, like venting. We vent negative emotions like anger and we feel better. However, when relief terrorists treat catharsis as um, nearly synonymous with getting something off your chest, they hardly do it justice. Thus we aim to be past what is dismissed as mere comic relief, as a cathartic and social catalyst, and thus as a major player in social politics. The energy and power that social misfits reclaim from repressive or um, authoritarian climates can strengthen not only their own resilience, and their, um, but also their social and political resolve. Feminist comics can heal gain agency, and reappropriate public space. Comic density can distract us from political tensions, but it also can heap up social movements and demands for political change. Through their propagation of laughter, feminist stand-ups, and from Roseanne Barr to one of the sides, or to Samantha Bee today, confront the continual war on nasty women to reappropriate a public culture and public space that has been marked as all too male. Now, physiological politics, this, this, this is what we think laughter is. It's physiological politics can demonstrate how laughter may well be the best medicine, but this is because the thought of venting can be much more than just um, an emotional release and return to just a calm, neutral state a state of uh, normalcy. It would be much more than just even return to, you know, let's say the calm tranquility, something like that. The stories do so for that too. The very processes may transform negative emotions if we actually convert negative emotions, like shame, the shame of those who have been deemed nasty, 
for a fit and to a positive pride, um, all while serving as a catalyst for challenging the hierarchies of the social landscape. So here on the screen I have just images from the slut walk movement, and this is in particular from Trisha Rose, who, uh, or I'm sorry, Amber Rose, who, um, uh, who has also released comic videos to go along with the slut walk movement. And um, what they basically do is they show how the fire laughter offers not just a reimagined uh, social life, but offers even a catalyst for it. And incongruity theory. Unlike um, relief theory, incongruity theory has retained its prominence over the past several centuries. This theory locates humor not primarily in the physical or emotional um, relief or some kind of physical or emotional process, but in something more cerebral. So it's more understood as being um, part of that, what we call the jack in the box, a jack in the box surprise that occurs with the violation of normal mental um, patterns and expectations. Now, while much of the intellectual relief continues to view out of control after as vulgar or as a sign of just being silly, um, as they have actually for eons. Cerebral puzzles are viewed as different. These puzzles produce a whimsical smile, giving the rational mind its own sense of satisfaction and elevation. And we call here uh, one example of this more cerebral kind of humor was Oscar Wilde's um, gallows humor. The, the celebrated cultural shift um, from laughing at social inferiors to the cleverness of elites and their games of wit defines according to historians the modernization of humor and hence its acceptance today as a virtue instead of a vice. So this was a this transformation happened over the last 300 years and then increasingly, uh, especially in the last 150 or so, where now humor is being seen as being a virtue and not a vice anymore. And it's primarily because of the focus on the cerebral, this um, more cerebral um, take on humor. This intellectual approach influences current understandings of humor from the use of cognitive science, and also those who draw on Freud and the later Freud. Now Freud argued, and this is again a later essay of his, um, that what draws a smile is not the animal or the body per se, because traditionally the idea was that you laugh down at those who, who, who remind you of animals or um, you know whose bodies are uh, are exaggerated in their presence. So yeah, this he argues is not so simple as that, but it draws a smile, but it's the incongruity of a human mind stuck in an animal body with its mortal fate. So humor ultimately becomes a satisfying mental exercise of reflection. Um, and when I say ultimately, I mean ultimately becomes even a um, reflection on this existential incongruity, this incongruity of what defines a human. The, the rational mind and the world um, body with all its humiliations and, um, and its yes, and out of control nature. Um, now this approach captures a dominant strand of thinking through the late 19th and 20th centuries, and it also recurs in kitchens, in youth of female humor. While blessing um, women for their early sense of fairness, kitchens settles down and this claim that humor is an intellectual defense. Um, cause of intellectual defense, um, cerebral defense against life itself, or what men battered by motherfucking nature and stuck in their mortal bodies can be referred to as a bitch. So that's his, um, again, his take on an idea that we saw in Freud and it started popping up about in the 1930s or so, this notion that we are um, um, you know, caught in this bitch of life and we, you know, we um, rationalize and talk the bitch of life. But to be sure, bitch whispering feminists too are aware of life's incongruities. Indeed, unmasking the unexpected social and political stakes that often have to work behind any such cerebral turn is one more task for uh, their often, not always, but often raucous um, belly laughs. As these feminist comics reconnect the head with the belly, their charged laughter enlists an element of surprise that gives a jolt to an entire bio-social system bound up in politics and power. And it really felt all the way down from the first brain to the uh, second brain located um, uh, yeah, in the valley, right? 
functions as an eye opener at the gut level. So here we're, we're turning from a mental jolt to a jolt to a biosocial system, and that being the locus of um, much of humor. So in contrast, in the first brain humor, first brain humor, the cerebral approaches, they distance the mind. Um, and one way or another, they're distancing, they distance the mind from the body politic. Um, let's see this. Um, these approaches also collude. Let's go down here. These approaches also collude with the assumption that due to the cerebral qualities of human, of humor, only humans, only um, human beings, can really exhibit true humor. Animals can't do it. Yet there is growing scientific evidence that non-human animals also lack. And this evidence punctures any assumption that human beings are ontologically separate from the animal. They were ontologically um, unique and at a distance from all of the animal species. Moreover, some of the more prevalent examples of animal laughter is showing something more. Okay, and that's what's interesting to us, even more interesting. Um, they underscore. Uh, well, we think that examples of animal laughter do is that they underscore that more than just incongruity is happening, that um, the social context of the laughter ma matters, that there's something more real at stake uh, that accompanies even intellectual laughter. So I think what I'm going to do is show you one, this is one popular um, YouTube video that um, uh, many of you may have seen on Facebook or other social media platforms. And um, what I want you to do is look at this carefully. What you'll see is at least I think um, that the, um, in this case, it's called monkey, it's called the monkey laughing as the orangutan. Um, but you'll see that the orangutan does understand the incongruity of this magic trick, uh, or this trick that's being um, played right here by his um, or her human companion. But something else seems to be at stake here, and that's what's interesting to us. What else is at stake? So here what we see is something a bit more, it looks like there's some kind of enjoyment, you know, not just of the trick, but the trick in the context of a jovial camaraderie. Uh, so look at how the orangutan reaches out towards the human and also looks out at the human. I think there's more than just something that's going on here. Oh, and now we might have a... <laughs> Now, let's go finally to the, uh, 
uh, last theory of humor because we think that these um, these examples uh, of um, uh, apes suggest um, or give nice examples of the last theory of humor, but also make us rethink it as well. Um, now the last theory, the fourth theory, <coughs> is that laughter originates in play. It's generally stated, um, or as it's generally stated, it draws attention to the playful mind's capacity um, for not being serious, is basically the idea, for transcending petty circumstances, for disengaging from a burdensome world of good and evil. Uh, the idea is that we laugh in life as in play, that laughter allows us to shrug off problems, to lighten up, to learn to roll with the punches. And no doubt, a uh, good sense of humor can be like learning to lighten up and roll with the punches. And no doubt, in the usual conflicts and the petty annoyances of ordinary life, those who partake of humor learn how to maintain the cheer. And no doubt, such humor serves well to enhance workplace efficiency and a smooth, flowing corporate culture that would be impeded by minor annoyances and conflicts. True, sometimes when life is unfair, you roll with the punches. But sometimes, sometimes you have to punch back. And indeed, recent research on animal behavior across species uncovers how important play may be for cultivating a sense of justice, suggesting that play might be recontextualized as a profoundly ethical activity. Based on observations of wolves and other carnivores in his backyard in um, Boulder, Colorado, uh, biologist Mark Beckhoff offers a hypothesis um, and so hypothesis is not about humor directly, it's actually about play. And he observes the play of the animals in his backyard, including his own dogs and all. And he, um, he's arguing that play is where animals learn to be fair. But I think his observations also allow us to trace the origins of laughter and humor to a sense of not just play, but also fair play. That social play, as he says, is based. Uh, social play, he says, is based on a foundation of fairness. Um, now he speculates um, that such playful antics as displaying a uh, soft underbelly, or you know, also you know vulnerable parts of the body, so also the carnivores displaying their necks to one another. But you know, very commonly, the soft, the soft underbelly. That's one more thing that one thing they do. Many things they do. Um, that provide a training ground for neutralizing differences between dominant and subdominant animals. They do that to neutralize differences so that they can play. They recognize the hierarchies, but then they neutralize them. And what they then do, the actual play activities, and uh, they call they call those through these uh, very intricately, very interestingly too. What they do through the play activities, they learn how to trust one another. And interestingly, too, for ethics, they learn, he argues, they earn reciprocity, they learn how to take turns. Paralleling other forms of play, humor, too, suspends hierarchies. Leveling the playing field as we, too, take turns showing our underbellies and serving as the butt of a joke. In short, to conclude, um, and to twist the words of uh, our old friend, Christopher Hutchins, Science, or at least our science, suggests the common can on occasion like women prefer to life. So, Cynthia would welcome your comments and questions, and I'll let you feel the questions. Okay, thank you. And also, what I'm going to do is I have a final slide that's a summary of those four uh, theories of humor and then laughter, and then the restatements of them. Yes. Hi. Thank you for your talk. I loved it. Um, it resonates with so much of my own project in thinking about comedy. Um, I wonder, do you make any distinctions between um, comedy and humor and even laughter as different phenomena, or yeah. do you see them connected? Or 
how yeah, and, yeah, and they, and there are the, there are distinctions, and they're really important distinctions because it turns out there's even let's say between comedy, humor, satire, wit, you, right. you yeah. know, even to expand the field, ridicule, as you know, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of um, uh, all kinds of uh, politics at stake in those distinctions, and then laughter itself doesn't need to be just part of a joke or a humor. So the first thing to say about that, most interestingly, is it seems as though laughter, well, let, let's take an example. Let's take an example of how oftentimes when people meet, you know, we might meet you know, randomly on a sidewalk or whatever, the first thing we may do is laugh, and there's no joke or anything like that. But that suggests something basic about laughter, that laughter seems to have, um, if you want to use evolutionary theory, some kind of function and social bonds. It seems to go back more than anything else to um, negotiating our social bonds. So it's a profoundly social activity, laughter is. So that's, that's one thing that's very interesting about laughter. Um, and then you may know there are many other interesting um, stories about it, too, including from the science, the laughter, um, uh, there's that experiment um, that people know about now, I think, um, the first half a few years ago where, uh, I want to say lab rats, but uh, it's actually experimenters in a lab uh, would tickle the rats uh, that were a part of their project, and the lab, they it, it could use um, technology to hear laughter from those rats, and there would be a kind of bonding that would happen. So laughter is very interesting as, a, as one aspect of comedy and of um, humor, of one aspect, in reminding us of its social, its connection with the social. Uh, but then, yeah, with humor, humor, um, really, one of the most interesting books on humor is Daniel Wickberg. I don't know if you know his book. Um, but he looks at the history of humor and uh, uh, really starting several hundred years ago and then looks at how ridicule, the, you know, the old notion of humor is primarily ridicule, laughing down at others. This ridicule, like satire, censored or um, thought as though it should be censored. Uh, humor turns into an appreciation of wit in really kind of elitist cultures in Europe, and then finally into a having a sense of humor. So he argues that that what is called a sense of humor developed maybe 150 years ago, and that was an idea that developed um, along with corporate culture. So it, it was a way of us mocking ourselves, sure. but to allow the world and politics as usual to you know, continue, to roll with the punches, that idea. And then it gave rise to, in the 20th century, these ideas of uh, this kind of existential idea that um, we rise above our circumstances and mock them. Um, but yeah, so there's a whole range of ideas out there, and uh, that even that just Scratches the surface. Just scratches the surface. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just a clarificatory question. Um, I just want to check. You're not saying that incongruity isn't funny. Um, is that right? You're, you're, you're saying it's. It's the, the trouble with incongruity theory is that it states the reason for it being funny as being too intellectual, as some kind of intellectual game. Uh, that it's um, that the incongruity. So what we're doing is we're we want to give it a, a broader context and understand aspects of the use of incongruity very differently. Okay. So incongruity is funny, you know, and there's incongruities all over, and it, it, you know, it ironies, you know, reversals, um, the unexpected, the jolt. Some forms of incongruity that we think are humorous are primarily mental and may indeed uh, in some way or another give us a kind of cathartic relief, a kind of elevation about the pettiness of life. Okay. And that the, might be a lot. So just uh, okay. the reason why I asked was, uh, was only because there are many cases where, um, I mean as far as like, if we take for example the, the fart in a lift, it's funny because it's an inappropriate place to do a fart. Uh -huh. um, and at that on that basis, you get in a lot of really really good comedy, which um, which you may well like. For, uh, for example, there's a scene in the film *Bridesmaids* where the bride 
having, yeah. having food poisoning, has yeah. to run out into I've the street yeah. and do a big poo in the street in yeah. a wedding dress. Yes, that's 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 hilarious. Right. Um, uh, but 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 you're not saying that that's not funny. It's uh -huh. it, because it is in the context of, as you say, of friendship and. Uh -huh. I was saying what's interesting in that case, what's interesting in a lot of cases, and that would be an example, is it, but the incongruity, why the incongruity is funny is that it's not just mental, but that there's something more at stake, and that something more at stake, it could be different things, you know, but um, among other things, it may be, you know, it, 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 broadly, it's about negotiating our social relationships with others, how we're seen, what kind of status we have, and um, what kind of capital, social capital we have. That's, that's to recontextualize it in that kind of way. And then, and then also the other thing too is like, moving from that idea that, it, that incongruities are funny just because of the mental jolt. Oh, it's like, oh, I didn't think of, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting that. Sometimes, you know, something like that account is too. But really, there's also all this other kind of humor that it, where that jolt is, this whole, has a whole biosocial system yeah. um, unraveling. And that we want to explore more. You see, and, and, um, and then the other thing we're saying is just that um, we're emphasizing like recontextualizing and reconnecting the head to the gut and, and yeah. Yes. Just in a really quick defense of incongruity theory, because I think I might have been thinking what you were. Oh. I agree with everything you said about it. Um, but I, I don't know that maybe some proponents of incongruity theory do think of it as cerebral, but I always took it as simply showing what the target of the emotion was, right? Mm -hmm. So just as uh, fear involves the recognition of danger, amusement involves the recognition of incongruity, uh -huh. and it could yes. be every one of those things that you mentioned. Yes, so yes. Not and necessarily and cerebral so just, at all then. Yeah, <laughs> and, so, and so if you like, it's kind of like a move to a more contextual yeah. understanding of that incongruity. So, so just that, just sheer incongruity itself is not enough for the full force of the humor. You have to draw on that context as well, and that context is what adds the edge. Um, and then and the final jolt is more than just, oh, there's something here that's out of whack. There's like, yeah, I mean, this is just affecting the whole. Just as there's more to fear than the recognition of danger. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. And so that whole social field um, of affect and power is disturbed. That whole field that we're on is disturbed. And that's what's interesting to us, the way in which that field is disturbed, because we're interested in social change. I'm thinking about the, the concept of catharsis, and I'm thinking that it would be helpful for me to understand what you're saying, and also for us to be, have a shared language to clarify the use of that its meaning in this. And so, I mean, from a, from a psychological perspective, social psychology mm -hmm. research has basically very well demolished the idea yes. that yeah, I'm, not, I'm not telling this for you, I'm just trying to like have a shared understanding. Demolish the idea that acting aggressively yeah. quote, gets after your aggression and therefore you're less likely to be aggressive. Yes. It's, but it's also true that if you have a well of, of tension, that that's, there's a physiological tension there, like going for a run, and the physical can release that tension in a, in a different sense. So I'm thinking that if we agree on that understanding of, 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 of viruses, so if expressing aggression makes you more likely to aggress, Right. right. In this idea of uh, cathartic healing, relief, venting, yes. right? And you were saying that there's this idea of the sharing with laughter, the friendship. So is it possible to think of it this way, that laughter is cathartic, not in the sense, the, the, you know, the disproven sense, that it releases something, mm -hmm. but that you're actually doing something, just yes. as when you hit someone, you're expressing your aggression, and it makes you more likely to aggress. Yes. When you laugh, you're basically making yourself more likely to laugh. Uh -huh. And then that's a shared social experience. Mm -hmm. So that the laughter um, produces more laughter, uh -huh. not because it's necessarily because it's relieving some pressure, uh -huh. but because it's self-reinforcing in a social sense. Mm -hmm. And oh, this is what one does when one is faced with a challenge or an incongruity or any of these other things. So is, yes. is that the is that how you think a of part of it? Part of it. Or is yeah. there something else that you think something more too? Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, multiple things. But that part of it is just that you're right. Like that laughter itself, just physiologically, 
that, you know, what all it does, improving our immune system, you know, all these kind of studies that are all over the, right. the internet right now. Um, you know, part of it, and, and it's contagious effect, yeah, part of it is that. But uh, here, here, I'm thinking of going back to stoic conceptions of uh, catharsis and understanding how for the stoics, they thought that what humor did was it allowed you, you know, their, their account is not going to use it, but we're borrowing some aspects. So what they thought that humor does is that when you laugh uh, at a situation or you create some wit to rise above a situation that would otherwise make you angry, for example, if there's angry, for example, um, then, then what you do, um, it, with what humor does is it, it, it um, dissolves that uh, anger and it makes us tranquil. Okay? The lady stoics emphasize more the tranquility. It just makes us, it calm, it's calming. And what, what we're doing is we're going back looking at Slutwalk, for example, the movement and the use of humor um, uh, by Amber Rose in that um, movement. And we're arguing that, you no, know, we see there what she's doing, that humor, she's using visual images, so let's get that too, but she's using images to help convert the negative emotion, in this case it's pro, uh, shame, sorry, it's shame, um, which we talked about, I know, um, it's shame into not just to a normal state where we don't feel shame anymore, are we risen above our shame? That would be the stoic approach, okay? But instead, uh, using those images to convert that uh, shame into pride. Okay? And when I talk about Im when we talk about images, we mean like images on the social media as well as with the uh, movements. And it seems like it's a social solidarity process. Yes. Yes. The yes. 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 And and that part is one element that gets left out of uh, left out um, by the psychologists. That solidarity. So that's very very. It, it, but it's also like the force. There's a philosopher, Hannah Arendt, who talked about the force of movements on the street, but it embodies on the street protesting the father, the father, the father, et cetera. There's a lot of people writing about this. But the idea is that there's a force there, you know, and that force actually alters the shape of space, uh, the, it alters the space we're in. Um, it alters the affects and the positionality of space itself. That's the idea. So it's an actual, it, it's functioning. Uh, as a catharsis um, because it's converting negative into a positive emotion, but also in order to do this because we're deeply embedded and embodied social creatures, we cannot do that with the individual alone, stoic view, okay? It can only do it when it alters the social space in which we are interwoven. It's got to change that space, and then again, an individual can't do it by themselves, we need solidarity. From a social side, like you're creating new norms. Yes, exactly. You're creating new norms, and the feel of the atmosphere is different cool. with those norms. Yeah, Thank that's you. the idea. Uh, yes. Um, so going back kind of to the beginning of essentially Hitchens' position, he used a lot of derogatory and misogynist language yes. to say, to kind of officially just cut down women in general first. So they're already taken down a peg before he goes back and says, oh, and they're not funny. Yes. Uh, but even removing that aspect of it where he already puts himself on a higher position and going back to that original, well, men are the originators of humor, and originally it was ridiculing. Uh, essentially, I, I drew two conclusions, not two conclusions, but essentially take, takeaways. Uh -huh. um, from like the feminist movement in the 90s, once Rush came out, it essentially was women in humor stopped saying, I want a seat at the table and started saying, we'll make our own table. Um, mm -hmm. And we're gonna have it, we're mm -hmm. gonna stop catering to the mm -hmm. male idea because men have dominated the culture and they said they set it up in a sense or whatever they want to say they did. Uh, because I mean, what, it, it's the same thing as like the Tupperware parties where feminist movement started. That was a female space where of course they ridiculed the men and they made fun of and I'm sure they didn't just talk about men either. It's the same thing that we do now. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if, if at least in your opinion, uh, as of right now, are we moving to a place where now that women have set up their own table, there could be a collaboration. There could be instead of just uh, Paul F. Tompkins, you know, he's directing bridesmaids and stuff like that. Oh, that's so nice of him, you know, like giving yeah. uh -huh. women a space on, giving women a space to have their voice or whatever. Yeah. But it's still that 
essentially it was the, it's supposedly the answer to the hangover as much as it was witty and funny and everything. That's what these female leads are doing. Is it, are we moving into a place in, in, with feminism and intersectionality that men and women don't have to try, and men don't have to ridicule and cut down women, and women don't have to try and cater to men to have legitimacy, in rather than separate spaces actually coming together in collaborating in humor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, what, you know what, I almost want to turn that back and ask what you think. Uh, do you see that kind of change happening? Because I see absolutely what you're otherwise describing. So even in the '90s, like women, you know, along with like, um, see, we've been talking about, uh, you know, some, you know, some of the, you know, all these. Um, so after the right wing uh, took over humor through talk radio shows <laughs> in the '80s, early '90s, then the left fought back. And you have the Colbert Report, and you have Al Franken. He attempted a radio show. So you have the left fighting back, and, and then and feminism starts to change too. So you have feminists using more humor. The Gloria Stein, we quoted her, but you know she doesn't use it too much. Um, but you have know, much more use of it. So you have all these kind of changes. You have kind of fight you know, using the weapons of humor. Um, it's like a humor cultural war groups. Yeah, humor war. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and then um, and so that's that seems to now as far as I can see we're still in that um, but the big ch some of, there are some changes within that that'd be interesting to talk about but I, I still see us in that I guess um, it's kind of like because yeah, oh, think sorry. of the monkey think of the um, Tina Fey um, you know the whole I don't know if you've heard all the stuff around Tina Fey and her um, you know her uh, NBC, um, 30 Rock, you know, where she, you know, one more time, what was that just a couple months ago, one more time she replaced that same, you know, that same debate, can women be funny? It seems like that's still, you know, unfortunately a, a problem throughout much of mainstream culture. It seems like it is. That's, uh, I think it's kind of like, um, it was, it was a document, I forget which documentary it was in, but it was on, um, Chris Rock gave, said, we're living in a time with the most conscientious white people's on race. Mm -hmm. and, however, we just elected Donald Trump. You know, there's mm -hmm. still that, you know, it's, it's, it's still obvious problematic. Obviously, there's white supremacy that's still subversive, but there, and we feed it. Mm -hmm. And there's a systemic issue of oppression. And I think it's the same in humor as far as it's cyclical and in a circular motion of laws and and judiciaries and, and our government set up what we instill as a culture and our culture feeds back to the laws we instill. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 just like with Bill O'Reilly right now, he, he's a criminal. He doesn't have a criminal record, but he's 13 million in sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is a crime, and he's obviously done it. Uh, however, he's allowed to uh, profiteer in the right wing and conservative spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that started with, uh, just the inceptiveness of Rush Limbaugh when, specifically when he called uh, Chelsea Clinton the dog of the White House at 12 years old. I think she was just 12 or 14. It, I don't, um, I definitely think we've moved on that. We've moved past that. There are a lot of men who at least say they're feminist, <laughs> which used to be a dirty word to even say for a man, uh, even if they don't fully get it and it is problematic and they're not a true ally in a sense. But as far as currently, I do think that we are living in a time with the most conscientious at any time in history of men that do actively see that gender equality, look, you can still have a good time when everybody's on the same playing field. Mm -hmm. Just because you poison the playing field for you to be able to profit off of it, humor doesn't have to be a profiteering market. Mm -hmm. A zero-sum game. Correct. Mm -hmm.